speak this morning. This morning I want to speak on the toughest discipline of the Christian faith. Uh, the toughest of disciplines. Somebody might say, well, that's evangelism. Well, no, it's really not. Oh, it's tithing. No, it's really not. Uh, it's a discipline to read your Bible every day. No, it's really not. What's the tough, toughest discipline of the Christian faith? Well, the other night, I was going to take Marty to dinner after she'd worked a long, hard day and take her out for a nice meal. We went to Longhorn Steakhouse, and we walked in, and I, I like that place. It's, it's good. And the first thing you want to do is hang you one of those little beeper things, you know, that goes off. And... Uh, but then she informed us they were on a 40 to 45 minute wait. We went to Chili's. <laughs> in this drive through have it your way, microwave world we live in, waiting is avoided like the plague. Nobody likes it. Nobody wants to do it. And But that's exactly what God called his followers to do in the book of Acts. And that's exactly what he calls you and me to do in our day very often as we seek to follow Him. And it is the toughest of Christian disciplines. Not easy now, and I'm quite sure it was difficult for them in that day. I kind of put my foot in my mouth one day. It was an older couple. They were getting ready to have surgery. And it was down at Skyline, and I was going to sit with them and have prayer with them, you know, as good pastors do. And, and uh, they handed them one of the little beeper things. And we'd say, and they said, oh, they give us this like in the restaurants, go off when it's time. I thought, oh, okay. And we sat there and we talked a while and I think, rrr, 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 you know, go off. And I looked up and said, oh, your table's ready. <laughs> Not the thing say somebody's fixing to have surgery. But, uh, you know, nobody likes to wait. I don't, I don't like it. And I don't think anyone enjoys it. And certainly our disciples struggled with it as well. The disciples were told by Jesus he had he'd been crucified, he had resurrected from the dead, he had appeared to them throughout a 40-day period, and now he called them out to the Mount of Olivet, and he gave them instructions. He said, you're going to be empowered with power from on high, not many days from now, but go to Jerusalem and wait. There's that four-letter word again. Wait. Go to the restaurant. Wait. Go get your car inspected. Wait. I, you know, we hear it all the time. I don't think anybody likes it, but yet it's, it's a discipline that God calls for us to have in our life because while we're waiting does not mean things aren't going on. He's very much at work, even in us, while we wait. So let's look at Acts this morning, chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. And let me encourage you, keep your Bibles open throughout this message and perhaps be prepared to jot down other scriptures that I might refer to during the message. And for those of you who view online, I encourage you to do that as well. So let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, shall we? This was after Jesus had instructed them. It said in verse 12, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days... Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who were arrested, Jesus. And he, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle of his, and his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Hakel Dama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, let no one live in it, 
and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all this time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he may go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lots fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. May God add his blessing the reading of this word. Thank you, may be seated. You may be wondering, what in the world does that have to do with me? Well, it has everything to do with the discipline of waiting. And I don't know that anyone has mastered that yet. These disciples, they followed Christ, waiting for him to deal with Rome. Waiting for him to reestablish Israel's independence. They lived hand to mouth, waiting. They observed the miracles. They saw him crucified, still waiting. They saw him after his resurrection, still waiting. They received his instructions to go and wait. And there's that word again go to Jerusalem and wait. Back in verses 4 and 5, that's exactly what he told them to do. Now, you may disagree with me on this, but I, I believe out of our study, I've come to a conclusion. I personally believe that Peter and the disciples jumped the gun a bit. Now, whether they did or didn't doesn't matter. The truths that I'm going to portray in this uh, message are no less valid. But I'm coming at it from the aspect that I believe they kind of jumped the gun. And I'll, I'll give the reasons for that. For impulsive Peter, always running ahead. That was his lifestyle. That was his habit. That's what we had seen in him over and over again. The Mount of Transfiguration, he wanted to build three altars. Jesus said, that's not what this is about. Matthew and Mark and Luke speak out of about one of those cut off the servant's ear uh, when Jesus was arrested. But John gives it away. It was Peter. <laughs> Whipped out his sword and cut off the servant's ear. I love Peter. I love him so much. Every Easter cantata I've ever been in when we betray the Last Supper, I'm always <laughs> Peter. I don't know why. But that's who they always make me. So I love Peter. I can kind of relate to him. He had the courage of his convictions. And whether others thought about it, when others were thinking about it, Peter acted. I admire that. The problem is sometimes we need to stop and pray for God's direction before we act. Peter didn't always do that. And I believe this could well be one more of those situations. Now, let me make something clear. Heaven and hell don't hang in the balance of whether he acted <coughs> too quickly or not. They don't. Whether we agree or disagree doesn't matter. What does matter <coughs> is that God has some truths for us about waiting. And they were experiencing the strain of it all there as they sat in Jerusalem. First thing simply is when God says wait, he means it means in verse 4 and 5, before I read this morning, it says, Be assembled with them. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You've heard from me, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Go and wait for it. Now, I'm sure they didn't quite know what that was going to look like or what that was going to feel like, but they had a promise that something's going to happen if we sit and we wait. And they went and they waited and they waited and they waited and they waited. I remember Christmas morning. We used to have a ritual at my house that I, I think bordered on child abuse. <laughs> <laughs> we were not allowed to go into the Christmas tree and the, see what all we'd gotten until mom and dad were up 
And then after they were up, we had to wait for Mom to get out the 8 millimeter movie camera, <laughs> wind it up, open a box, get out the light bar, unfold it, assemble it, hook it to the camera, plug it in. I was about to die! I can remember literally pounding the floor. I was so excited waiting to come in. But I had to wait for her. And then what happens when you open the door? You're blinded by these lights. You can't see anything. <laughs> but that's the way it was back in the 50s. Waiting has never come easy. But when God, but I'll tell you one thing. When Mama said wait, she meant it. And I knew it. And as hard as it was, I had to do it. The word wait actually comes from two terms in the, in the Greek. Uh, it means on account of or in reference to, and then to tarry. You combine those two words. In other words, tarry because of. When he said wait, God said it, he meant it. And so that's what those words come from. G. Campbell Morgan has a great quote about waiting. I think explains it as well as it can be. Waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, activity under command. Second, readiness for any new command that may come. And third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. Ouch, that's hard. That's tough stuff. That's maturity in the Christian faith. Activity under command. There's no, sin, there's no sign that God told Peter to stand up and say this. Wait for the command. Second point this morning, there's great pressure not to wait. I mean, there's really a lot of pressure not to wait in this day. You uh, said in those days Peter stood up in the midst. Well, he was a leader. Their Lord had been taken up from them into a cloud, and Peter was the rock. He was a leader. He was expected to lead. And they sat there, and they sat there, and they sat there, and he was under pressure to do something. I tell you, when you've got a leader, you expect them to lead. You don't expect them to wait. So there was great pressure on him. <coughs> You know, there's a sense of surely we must need to do something. You know, there's all these ads today about high-speed Internet. And how you, you don't want to be slow. Anybody ever have a slow upload or download on your computer and feel like it takes forever like that? You know, you feel like that's how you're going to end up. And so the big thing now is faster and faster. And it is nice when you hit the button and what you want is there. But as you know, it doesn't always happen that way. More like this. You sit there, feels like forever. You know, the problem is you can make more money, you can make more friends, but you cannot make more time. What's the favorite expression you hear all the time? Stop wasting time. Because we don't feel, we feel like we're wasting time when we wait. There's a pressure there not to wait. A lot of women feel a pressure to get married because of the biological clock. They feel like it's ticking. You know, in reality, God, holds, God knows all that situation and He understands where you are and what's going on. The Lafayette group was planted. We last June went up and had dinner with some folks just to make the offer of starting a Bible study up there. And you know, we said there's no pressure, there's no obligation, but we just want you to understand our concept of how we're doing church and why we do what we do. And we did. We planted the seed. And we left. And it wasn't three, four weeks. People were saying, what about the thing? What about, what's going to happen? I don't know. We're going to wait. We're not going to press it. Because if we press it, then people are involved reluctantly and it'll die. We're going to wait for God to give the burden to someone up there. And we'll walk through the open door when and if God opens the door. And we waited and we waited and we waited. And in November, somebody said, did y'all ever do anything with that? And someone up there, and I said, well, no, we're waiting to hear from y'all. Well, I want to do it. Great. Let's talk to a couple of them. Talk to a couple of them, see if they're willing. 
Yeah, there's several of us willing. Great. So we looked at the calendar and Acts was starting. That was going to be the perfect time. So you see, it was hard to wait, but waiting was the right thing to do. And it's that way with kingdom work. There's an urgency, because especially when we see the slippery slope and the decline in society and the breakdown of the family and all those things. We feel an urgency, and we should, an urgency to serve. But I'll tell you what, when it comes to specific acts of ministry, starting new things, wait for the command of the Lord. Third truth this morning, waiting requires a teachable spirit and a leadable heart. We live in a day where a lot of people like to think they know everything. <coughs> what? I don't know everything. A teachable spirit and a leadable heart. Are we willing to be led? Do we think there are people who think they know better than God what ought to happen? You know, he's got the benefit of the bigger picture. We need to trust him with that. Word says in verse 24, They prayed and said, You, O Lord, know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you've chosen. Now, in the selection of Matthias, that's the only reference to prayer. Well, guess what? Peter had already said they ought to do it. They had already nominated and had it narrowed down to two, and their prayer was, Lord, tell us which one of these two you've chosen. How about, Lord, is it your time for us to do this? You see, you don't see that anymore. Instead, they took out the dice, you know, seven eleven, my thanks. <laughs> and sometimes we like to press the hand of God in that way. And whether they were right or wrong, I believe that uh, there's a real tendency to want to decide how things ought to work. We've got to have teachable hearts. Looking to his word, recognizing that we don't know it all, recognizing that he may have an insight for us. Recognizing that someone we just soon not get an insight from may give us one. Let it take heart. Let it take root. Allow the Lord to lead. Samuel Morse, Betty Morse Code, was once asked if he ever encountered uh, situations where he didn't know what to do. He said, more than once, whenever I could not see my way clearly, I knelt down and prayed to God for light and understanding. He received a lot of orders and honors for his invention of the telegraph, but he felt undeserving. He said, I have made a valuable application of electricity, not because I was superior to other men, but because solely because God, who meant it for mankind, must reveal it to someone, and he was pleased to reveal it to me. You see, he sought the Lord. He was leadable and teachable, and God used him give us the telegraph, which you know, we don't use the telegraph much in our day, but it was a start of modern communication. In Deuteronomy 9.6, the people were warned, said, therefore understand the Lord your God is not giving you this good to land to possess it because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. They became unteachable, unleadable. They didn't want to follow God anymore. Beloved people, in our day and time, the, the population at large wants to trust big brother, brother there rather than God for their provision. We've become stiff-necked. In Psalm, the psalmist showed the right heart in Psalm 130, 5-7. He said, I will wait on the Lord, for my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. And the word wait in the Hebrew means to look for with expectancy. Folks, if God has led you in a certain way, to, and you're involved in a ministry, and he brings you to a point, so I just don't know what to do next, stop and wait with expectancy. Because he's at work behind the scenes. In your waiting, he's at work in you. Training us to become more like Him. Training us, building our faith to trust in Him while He's at work in ways that we can't see. Tough stuff. But it's the real deal. Always ready for that next baby step that He gives you. He won't often give you a whole mural of where it's going. He'll give you that next baby step. And you take it by faith. 
And then you wait with expectancy again for that next baby step. And as you're faithful, he shows up and he honors it. Lastly this morning, nothing truly flourishes done apart from his power. We could have pushed forward and started this or that. And, you know, someone said once that you know there was a point when you could have started a church that day with 75 people the next week. But you know what? God didn't lead that way. We took our time and let God do the planting in His time. The word says they cast lots and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, I know casting of lots was done some in the Old Testament, but folks, I would caution you, that's not the best way to find the will of God. If you believe it is, you know, if, if I believe that, I take all my monthly bills and throw them up and the ones that stick to the ceiling are the ones I pay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we have a better relationship with God than that. He can speak to our heart. He can impress us, speak to us through our, His Word and through circumstance and impress our hearts in a way that we know what to do. In Psalm 59.9, the psalmist said, I will wait for you, O you, his strength, for God is my defense. In Isaiah 8.17, he said, he said, I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. If God's silent right now, you determine to cling to him and not let go. For he is still at work, and he will speak, and he will make his way clear. And he may not do it in the time we think he will, and he may not do it in the way we think he should, but he will speak, and it will come clear. In Micah 7, 7, said, Therefore I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. You make sure you're open to hearing him also. So simply three things that we need. A heart of obedience, a listening ear, and a patient soul. Anybody got all three of those mastered? That's why you need the sermon. That's why I need this sermon. This all applies to us. And this verse applies to us also, as Isaiah spoke. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. These are trying times. They're perilous times. They're, they're a little bit frightening times for those who have lived in this great bubble of freedom known as America. Some things are under a threat now. Folks, I wish I could tell you we're going to see it get better. I don't believe that. I think we need to condition ourselves to the reality that we can live in victory regardless of circumstances. Wait on the Lord. He'll renew our strength. We will mount up with wings as eagles. We will have kingdom impact through His strength and power and to His glory. We'll run this race and we won't be weary. We'll walk this race and we won't faint. Isn't that a great promise? Do you know him this morning? Have you come to the place in life where you've given Christ your heart? I truly hope so. If so, this message will be an encouragement to you. It's more of a message for believers. If you've not professed Christ as your Savior, then let this be the day. Because he loves you. And he's got a plan for your life right where you are. Let's pray. Father, we come before you.